My name is Venetia Pons, and I'm a, what am I? Research coordinator. I'm a research coordinator mm -hmm. for Samuel Proctor Old History Program at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Today is June, June 28th, 2017. 2017, and I'm here with... Paul Ortiz, director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. And we're about to interview... Curtis Michelson from Orlando, Florida. The professor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Julian Chambliss from Orlando, Florida. Oh, I'm professor of history at Rollins College and according to the Africa and African American Studies program there. And, and we're here to talk about Oscar Mack. Um, we're doing a project on the Oscar Mack, we call it the Oscar Mack Project, and it has to do with a man that was supposedly lynched in the 20s. And so we're going to start off with Curtis, mm -hmm. and he's going to tell us how this project really began. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I've had a, a bit of history doing this kind of work, looking into um, lynchings and race-based atrocities. Um, back in the 90s, I was part of a group called the Democracy Forum, and we looked into, inspired by the work of Sherry Dupree and the Rosewood Forum and what happened there, we looked into the Ocoee Massacre, which is the Election Day Massacre of uh, a whole community in Ocoee, and the lynching of July Perry in downtown Orlando. And um, that work went on for almost a decade, and, and over, there were books written, and there were plays, and there were movies and documentaries made. Um, and it, as this work tends to do, it kind of comes in waves, and it kind of went into a lull. And then around 2012, I went to a conference that was organized by Alliance of Truth and Reconciliation in Atlanta. Um, or in collaboration with STAR, which is Southern Truth and Reconciliation. And they were pulling together a lot of different groups from um, around the country to talk about these type of projects. And so that was uh, February 2012, and it, it just sort of reawoke in me, realizing that, wow, this, this work is still going on. There's more groups popping up. We did a memorial service that day. This was just outside... Um, I think Athens and uh, Sam Hose, who was lynched in 1898. We did a memorial service for him that day. And one of my uh, founders, friends, and, and good friend and founder of the Democracy Forum, Sandy Cawthorn, was with me. And she said, Wow, we, I haven't looked at this material. We have archives, we have crates mm -hmm. and digital archives. And we were looking through all this material again. And in that process, I came across a clipping that I'd never seen before. And it said, Oscar Mack lynched at Lake Jenny Jewel, downtown Orlando. And, and, and I looked at Sandy and I said, did you ever see that? Like, we've been you know, doing this work for so long and, and it just was kind of a shock. And I said, Sandy, that's, around, that's like just a mile from my house where I, I was living in South Orlando. And so it just sort of, whoa, it kind of reawoke me. I said, you know, here we go again. Here comes the next wave. And um, that's really where it began, just looking at what was already sitting in our crates and in our you know, closet where we were keeping these materials. And I said, well, let's, let's look into it. And so at the time, I think I ran into this gentleman here. Um, we were part of the Urban Think, Rethink. Urban Rethink, part of the Urban Think Foundation. It was a community hangout space in Orlando. And I saw this guy, and I said, uh, I, knew, I knew about this radical historian at, at Rollins <laughs> College, heard a few things about him. And I, I approached him. I said, do you want to do a... A project, and I told him about what we'd done with uh, Okoe. I said I want to do this again. This time, I want to do it differently and better. Uh, and by that, I said I want to involve students right off the bat because in the Okoe project, we'd had some fits and starts working with academics. We'd had some challenges, and I didn't want to go through those again. And I wanted to have students involved from the very beginning. And I we talked about that. And he said, well, you know what? I got a uh, theme for the next semester. And it just, timing was right. And so I said, well, Julian, let's do this. And he had agreed to, I think it was your winter? Was it the winter or spring? Or spring. spring? Spring 2013 yeah. semester, he was willing to allocate the class and bring the students along. And at that moment, there was the Pecha Kucha movement was getting going in Orlando. Our friend Eddie Sellover was starting, if you know, PechaKucha.org. It's a it's like a community talk series, community dialogues, and like TED Talks, but different format. And so I, I, I just approached Eddie, and I said, Eddie, you know, I, I just feel like this is a topic. And I pitched it, and I said, I think I'm going to call it From Lynch to Love. He said, you're in. He had one slot left. And so it was February. You know, all this was happening right at that moment. 
And I got up on the next stage and I just shared the story. You were in the front row and I and I and at the end one of the last slides, gonna Petra Kucha's twenty slides. Each slide runs for twenty seconds to the last slide. And I think the the nineteenth slide there was just black and I said, Central Florida, are you ready for the next project? And the room erupted. Because I just told Okoe and, and all these other stories from around the country, because I've been networked with these groups for so many years. And I even brought in stories from um, Germany and all, so forth. And the crowd said, yes, we're ready. So I said, well, Julian Chambliss here and I would like to introduce you to, and they're www.oscarmacproject.com. I bought the domain the night before. It, we launched. We launched at Petra Kucha in February 2013. And then he put his students on the project right away. And that's how we got rolling. Okay, so you run into him. <laughs> right. He's got this great idea. Right. So what were you thinking there? Um, yeah, we, we were working at Urban Rethink, um, and we had a discussion. And at the time, I was thinking about what I was going to do for the next semester. And in particular, I was going to teach African American history class, which I knew. It was going to be a community engagement class, which I also knew, which meant that I could create some projects that would require the students to spend extra time. Actually, you have to get a designation for community engagement, and it, and it basically translates into you're going to spend 10 to 12 more hours than a normal class because you have to do this community-based work. And so I was looking for the opportunity to do that kind of work, and I actually wanted to look at different questions about uh, race and space because actually this 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 class actually dealt with two different things. Like there was a group that dealt with the Okoye project with, with Oscar Mack, and then there was another group that dealt, dealt with a community called Gotha. Um, and the goal, it was a it's intro level class, right? So mm -hmm. this was one of the things that made it both uh, a challenge and a reward, right? Because um, thinking about the intro level classes for me, and I use this sort of like approach of like a kind of digital humanities approach. So there was certain sort of primary source driven research that we needed to do. Curtis showed me the book that he had found, the one book that he had found by Christopher Waltrip that really dealt with like um, anti-black violence in the 20th century. And he had like two pages mm -hmm. on, on, and where he mentioned this story and that was it. <laughs> And, and and it really wasn't enough. Like it was, we had a newspaper clip it and then I did a, a few other searches and found additional stories. The one that I always found, man believed to be Oscar Mack. Mm. That was the <laughs> phraseology of it. Man believed to be Oscar Mack. Looking Mack. back now, that Dang. was quite a turn right, of phrase. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. You're right, um, that's what and the that, And that said. was actually something that we found in the newspaper like, it was out of Pittsburgh or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it, right? So the the project became like a research project that lasted the entire semester for the, that work group. And their goal was to really sort of look at the, the lynching and try to build off what was the established work. We had to work in terms of like contextualizing um, anti-racist violence in Central Florida. So we read uh, civil rights movement, we read about Florida race history, uh, trying to contextualize the story. And this is a, a class where it's you know basically African American history survey, so they're kind of building the capacity to understand the thing that they're doing, but at the same time they also have to deal with the work of looking for this particular, very particular set of information. Um, and so we were able to sort of identify more information. So we found the Kissimmee Gazette, yeah. which was the the weekly that was printed in Kissimmee. The paper of record, the, news, yeah. the newspaper, and it, it told, told the story. So that's where we found the names of the men who, were, who went to his house, the name of the, of the postal worker who gave uh, Oscar Mack the gun. Oh, so that was in the newspaper? That was in the newspaper. Oh yeah, he probably had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was in the newspaper. Yeah, so, when, and of course, it, it, it's great for the students because, you know, how, how are we going to find a newspaper? Like, well, mm -hmm. we're going to have to go to the University of Record and see mm -hmm. if there's a chance we can find a newspaper from the town. Mm -hmm. And it happened, so, just so happened at the University of Florida, a digital newspaper project, and they had digitized the mm -hmm. Kissimmee Gazette, and that's where we found it. Um, and then we were able to sort of, like, from that, sort of identify those names. Like, well, see what we can find out about these names. 
and let's see if we can find a death certificate, right? Because every version of the work that that and research that we did showed that he he was listed as lynched, mm-hmm. right? The NAACP's report of lynchings, which they put out every year, you can download the copy that covers 1922. You go to Florida, mm-hmm. it's listed there in July. Oscar Mack lynched. It's there was never a hint in the published accounts that he got away, no matter what accounts we looked at. But we could never find the death certificate. And in fact, the students actually contacted the the state looking for a death certificate. Uh, they did. A, I think I did. Didn't I? Did, you, I did the actual request. Yeah, and I got the letter, request. the official letter back, saying no, no yeah. name match. Yeah. Right. Um, and did you help them? Because they also did a federal records request. Did you help? I them called them? the FBI. Yeah. And yeah. this, this let me add this little piece. This is about Waldrop because it's kind of interesting. Um, Waldrop, who wrote the book, and I don't remember the title of the book, but you're right. It was that period of uh, Jim some, Crow. It was kind of like. Any black violence in the 20th century? It was and like it was a, this, the it was white this, book is really like. And the struggle to get anti lynching legislation passed. Yeah. And we tried to reach Waldrop because we figured Christopher Waldrop, who was the one that had found something in the FBI files, and right. when we couldn't get it from the FBI, we tried to go to Waldrop himself. Problem was, he just suffered a massive stroke the month before we started the project. He couldn't speak. He was incapacitated. I got his wife on the phone, and she was heartbroken. She said, he would have so loved that you had taken this up and that you had now right. embarked on this. So she said, look, I'll, I'll do my best. I know where his notes are. She went through all of his papers, and she found his handwritten notes from the time he got to the FBI, the notes he took on how, and she sent those to us. And that's as close as we could get to Waldrop. But I, I mean, I'm, you know, it was just interesting right at that moment. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And so could you uh, spend a moment and talk about how? Yeah, Leon Howe. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> well, he's the FBI agent, I guess, on the ground at the time in Central Florida. It's not technically the FBI, but he's the Justice Department. Okay, Justice Department. You yeah. probably know more about how. Go ahead. Well, I know exactly the same thing, you know, <laughs> because we read the same thing. Yeah. So Leon Howe is an uh, agent. He's assigned to Florida. And when we first found his name, I remember I thought to myself, why does that name sound familiar? <laughs> why is this name sound familiar? I remember I'd seen it someplace else. He was also investigating Marcus Garvey. Like he was the person apparently that investigated everything that the Justice Department needed to investigate in Florida. Um, but he had caught wind of the intention of these people to to lynch, to attack uh, Oscar Mack. And he basically uh, sends a letter to his superiors <coughs> saying that the same group, and, and the phrase that I think we all sort of like perked up on was the same group that did the thing in Okoye, or at it again, they're going to yeah. attack this employee. And he's a federal employee because Oscar Mack had gotten, the reason people were out for him was because Oscar Mack, of course, had applied for and, and won a con- federal contract to take mail from the post to, from the rail mm. station in Kissimmee to the post office. So technically, he was a federal employee. And and Leon Howe basically makes this argument that they're they're going to we have to do something because this is a federal employee. Crickets, nothing happens, right? But but his estimation, his analysis is in the record, and that's mm-hmm. what. Uh, allow Christopher Walter up to like, like know these details of the story, mm-hmm. and then when we read the Kissimmee Gazette, that's when we started like getting the names of the people, right? Um, and and we're able to put together like, oh, there's a sequence of events here because the Kissimmee Gazette is a weekly, so you leave one issue and you leave another issue, like the story sort of changes uh, over that that sort of like two week span, um, but. Yeah, that's we should, how. We should, you know, we, you and I went to the physical location. Yeah, we did. We scouted around Lake Jenny Jewel. We should share a little of that story, too. Because, again, I living close to the, to the area, I kind of bike past it a lot and bike ride, and I know the lake. And it's fairly, I mean, it's not a huge lake, but it's one of the mid-sized lakes in central Florida. And um, I, I said, let's just go down, look and see the site. And we went around, and we found only one part of the lake, the southern side of the lake, that looked like there was a home that was probably there, in yeah. early 1900s, it's a beautiful old southern mansion style home right. on the south side of the lake. 
and we just both kind of got chills. And there was even like a little driveway Wait, that said, keep, keep out. out yeah. Well, we went in. <laughs> 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 and I had to we literally back my car out. We just went up as close as possible. <laughs> it's somebody's <laughs> home. We don't know who's living there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went there and we are like, this looks about the right age. This could have happened here. Something, you know. Uh, and it's odd because the actual location, it's not far from a, a federal facility, right? Like it's it's it's. It's so, also along the railroad track, track which yeah. connects to Kissimmee. Right. So you kind of almost in your mind you picture them bringing him up that line, mm -hmm. and there was a stop there at Lake Jenny Jewel. This was, and we should mention too, this is the oldest part of Orlando, right? right? When Orlando before Orlando was Orlando, it was Jernigan. Right. The very first post office in Central Florida is very near this lake. Right. Right on Lake Holden, right. which is it's the lake. Jernigan's. What was it? Jernigan's. Um, uh, he got like a uh, a land. Big land grant, a right? A big land grant for killing Indians, basically. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Seminole Wars, right? <laughs> yeah. So, congratulations. <laughs> you, you. 400 acres and 400 mules. And, mm -hmm. and there's, a, there's a small municipality, Edgewood. Yes, that's Edgewood. So, that's just right. Yeah. To that. So, all this felt physically right? Like this, yeah. And it was sort of on that road into downtown Orlando. If you go one mile more, further north, you're into downtown Orlando. Right. Um, so getting very close to where July Perry was lynched. So we, we looked at the physical space, too, a little bit. Yeah. And Felt spooky. <laughs> you know, you get a feeling about these sites. Yeah. So we, we our project, and, and it's worth knowing, our project was a project for students. Um, their life lives and dies for the semester. They care as long as semester goes on. They had to deliver a finished product, and at the time, um, my goal was to create a wiki because I was like, "Well, we can make this an ongoing project if that's sustainable." Um, and so, a lot of the information that was in the in the research went into like a kind of wiki space that we were using, and so that was sort of up. And Oscar Mac was there; all the projects from the class were there in this sort of like wiki space. And so it was up, and, and Curtis had his information up, and I think you, you linked to some of it? Or? I just took what your students did, and I copied it right oh, over okay. just to, cause I, and I think I asked your permission. Right, yeah, no, no, no. Because I, I, I remember yeah. one student in particular, Maria Gutierrez. Right, She yeah. kicked ass. She did right, great. Yeah, yeah. So you could tell she was into it. Did she have something on her own? Because it seems like I ran across her name on a, something all by herself, like huh. on a web page or something. Well, yeah, where so she's written about it. We hung out. We hung it off our site, right? Okay. Because it came out of his project with the students, and her work was good. She put, put a lot into it. Right. Yeah, yeah. She put a lot of work into it, and each each student was kind of responsible for different chunks. But she really sort of like commanded. I could tell she took the right. lead on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, you know, she was the student in a group project that had no faith in other people in the group. Right? Like, <laughs> You know, that kind of thing. Like, okay. And, and that was great, but it also created all kind of stress oh. for her. Because uh -huh. we had these discussions, which you never heard. Oh, about, interesting. Like, this, these people being you oh. and, and what you wanted. Oh. I'm like, look. You know, we work with community and community groups, and they have a lot of experience with this. And so some of the things uh -huh. they're asking you are born out of their experience working with, like, and trying to document a community-based thing, and so you have to measure what they're saying against what you could do, right? You had me come into the class one time. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, no. Yeah. And it's important when you're doing community-based work to, to have the community partner come into class because it was, it was described as they are a community partner, right? Right. So they're, they are supposed to, the, to understand that they, they have to produce work that's going to meet your expectations. <laughs> If they can. Well, right? She did. Well, she did. But, you know, in her mind, because, like, you know, all these other people aren't as bright as me. Oh. Right? So I was like, you know, mm. these, are, these are discussions that you never, uh, three parts never hear. Yeah, okay. My office hours, however, on fire were her anxiety. <laughs> and I was like, look, it'll be fine. Oh, wow. Let's think about, like, these outcomes. Interesting. And we're supposed, you, you, you're supposed to deliver X. Huh. And I think we're doing a good job, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll be pleased. Right. And, in fact, you know, at the end, everybody, like. Yeah was done um, and and then we were on to the next thing right yeah 
Um, I, I was like, Julian, aren't you going to do it again next semester? And then mm -hmm. I would keep going. He's like, sorry, we're moving on. It's like, oh, man, who's going to keep this going? Oh, right, yeah. You know? So after the class was over, <laughs> um, we, we had the problem of, which is always a problem when you're doing like community-based work. Are we going to be able to bring another class in to do the work? Um, another problem that grew out of this is that that space, <laughs> you never knew this, that oh. space came under a lot of like scrutiny from the Gotha part of the project. Really? Yes, they, they had issues. Wow. I knew it. Oh, <laughs> see, thank you. Thank you for interviewing him because now I'm getting the whole story. <laughs> yeah, I knew. Well, it's not your problem. Uh, well, no, I'm problem. your community partner. You're supposed yeah, to tell me everything. You're part of the community party. <laughs> so, so I had to like navigate the Gotha part. And I was like, okay, this is going to have to come down. <laughs> I cannot keep dealing with it because they have an internal strife around their history. Oh, and so. Wow. Yeah, one person, like, I want this change. Yeah, another person was trying. I'm like, this digital is like, whew, it's going to disappear. Like, <laughs> I'm going to archive this, and, like, I will, like, keep it everything. And if anybody needs something, but Curtis already has his website, so everything's fine. <laughs> it's up. So I'll awesome myself be available. You're making it sound like they did work on spec for our for our group. Like <laughs> no, no, I never contracted no, these no, students. No, 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 no. But like in order to, to sort of like just you know, get not get phone calls anymore. He's telling us we must go. Okay. Um, okay. We we decided to bring it bring it down. Okay, five and so here. that was th that didn't necessarily stop. So let's fast forward it. All right. So yep. at the end of it, right. um, what do you know about Oscar Mack? At the end, what we knew about Oscar Mack is that we were able to find his uh, records as a veteran. We knew mm -hmm. about uh, his experience. We still had knew sort of like the ancestral sort of census tract data. We knew that he had had this sort of like conflict growing out of the fact that he got this federal grant. And we thought we understood the story that he had been confronted, that he had shot and killed his attackers, that he uh, attempted to escape. In fact, like the, the, the news reports that he had escaped. But then the next news report is that he had been lynched. So the huge gap in my mind was where did they catch him and why did they take him to Orlando right. to lynch him? And why can't I find a death certificate? Mm -hmm. And so when the project was over, the, the sort of like goal of the project for the students was like, look, I need you to flush out. We're trying to flush out this story that exists on like one page, a page and a half of this book. And there seems to be no documentation of it. They did that. Um, and there was a hope that having a story up would generate more, more information. Which is indeed what happened because it kind of lays yeah. fallow for about a year. And I just keep the website up. I'm just paying the monthly fee to the web host. and. OscarMacProject.com is there. Maria Gutierrez's piece is linked to it. And then just out of the blue, <laughs> I was literally about to take the site down, thinking, what are we doing? You know, this isn't doing anything. And we get this call. Uh, if it came through as an email, because there's a contact us on, on the website, and James Brown says, we have more information. We've been looking into this. I think we should talk. I don't know who James Brown is, but I immediately he left, gave me his number. I called him. Uh, that day, as I shared earlier today, it was not a great week. I'd just been fired from a job. I was, uh, you know, just having a bad week. And, and I got on the phone, this man with a very deep voice says, we, my family has a story you need to know. And he starts to unravel it. And he says, we're very sure Oscar Mack is, he's my great uncle and he survived. And I just about dropped the phone and I just was, I remember just kind of tearing up because I just, I, I was first of all happy he survived. It's like, yes, finally I'm involved in a lynch story where the guy didn't get lynched. This is hallelujah, right? How often does that happen? Never. Yeah. So that was amazing. So I called Julian immediately, like, Julian, you won't believe this. And that's how we got to know James Brown and right. that got this conversation going where we are how today. How did you respond, Julian, when you heard? <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, I had been trying to do a little bit extra work, and I had come across a weird newspaper account of Oscar Mack getting away. And I, and I think I told you this. I don't remember that, but you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, <laughs> so when he called me, I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> this could be totally, true. Totally, uh, that's, this might be true. <laughs> this might be very true. Um, 
And then I was like, James Brown, really? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll stop on that. Yeah. We'll stop That's on perfect. that. That's we perfect. know where you guys live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this was excellent. All right, thank you. Yeah.